Well, thank you, for Prime Minister, for, for delivering a very substantive lecture, one that will be read closely in Australia and in foreign capitals in coming weeks. This is, I think, the fifth time you've spoken to the Institute. You spoke to us twice as Shadow Immigration Minister, as Immigration Minister, as Treasurer, and now as Prime Minister. It's quite an upward trajectory. Uh, I think the timing this time has been particularly clever on our part. Um, and let me go to the United States, if I can. Sure. Um, you're just back from a successful... Are we going to do this on the phone, or...? <laughs> it's not too soon. <laughs> Perhaps. Some congressmen think it is too mm. soon. But, but, PM, you're back from a successful US visit. You had the first state visit, uh, the first state dinner with the president since Mr Howard and, and George W Bush. You're one of very few Democratic leaders who has struck up a really warm relationship with the President. What's your secret? I know who you are. I know what you're about. Listen and take everybody, you know, at their word. I mean, you're not naive about these things, but people are people. It doesn't matter whether they're presidents or kings or queens or um, whatever role they happen to be in. Uh, these engagements. I said this recently when um, we had all of our heads of mission in Canberra and I reminded them that while it's terribly fascinating for them to write you know, voluminous cables dissecting the great strategic shifts of our time, their fundamental job was they're in the people business and their job is to connect with other people in the governments they're trying to connect with in the countries where they're serving us. And my job's not much different to that. Uh, we, you know, we get tremendous support from you know, the institutions, and I know there are many uh, of our senior uh, leaders in our public service here tonight, and I thank them for the great job they do. But uh, it is about making those connections and uh, being as uh, upfront as you can be, um, not giving people surprises, um, and listening carefully. And how do you find President Trump as an interlocutor? What's he like to negotiate with? What's he like to talk to? He's pretty straight up. <laughs> He's, I mean, I, Frank and I were chatting before. Um, I, when I first met Sir Frank, I was in the property industry, so I suppose that gave me a good insight. And uh, you know, people, I find, can often be quite trans transparent. And, um, you know, it, it, the job's made a lot easier because, you know, it was, it was, you know, personally very kind for Jenny and I, and I thought, Jenny did an amazing job um, to have that personal invitation to go and share that evening. But, you know, it, it wasn't about us, and, and frankly, it wasn't about him <laughs> and, and Melania. And Melania did an, an, an amazing job. The attention to detail that she put into that night expressed a lot about the respect they had. But it was about the respect for Australia, <laughs> and I'm sure John felt the same way when he was at a similar occasion many years ago. The respect between Australia and the United States is deep. It's forged in the most extreme of circumstances. And when I was meeting with investors in New York on the Friday, some of the biggest investors in Australia, their constant message was, Australia, we trust you, it's stable, it's safe, we share values, it's predictable, we are the safe port in the storm. And in a global economy that looks like the one we're currently in, I'm happy we're us. This week we learned that the President called you about um, uh, regarding Australia's role in the 2016 election and potentially the, the Mueller investigation. And you said yesterday that, of course, we said we'd, we'd grant the request and you'd do that to an ally. That makes sense. But can I ask you... Isn't it, isn't it inconceivable, the idea that someone like Mr Down or a former Conservative Foreign Minister would be in cahoots with the deep state in various allied countries to intervene in the US election? I mean, isn't, isn't it a ridiculous proposition? <laughs> well, I thought you summarised it well in your, your, your introduction. Alexander's always been a big lefty, as, as we know. Um, him and Nick Minchin, big lefties. The woke pair. I think, I think not. Um, but putting that to one side, look, the, the fundamentals of this are pretty straightforward. It wouldn't matter which president or which attorney general for an Australian prime minister was conducting an official investigation into whatever matter. It 
it would be extraordinary of any prime minister in those circumstances to deny what was a very straightforward request. And frankly, one that had already been communicated by our ambassador that we were happy to uh, cooperate with because A, we're not a party to the investigation. B, we're not the subject of the investigation. And C, we haven't got any issues. <laughs> so if this assists that issue to come to sort, some sort of close, which is a matter for US domestic politics, well, fine. Our simple granting of a very reasonable request to our most deeply entrusted and respected ally is, uh, I think, a, a fairly um, uh, un unremarkable event. All right, let me ask you about China, if I can. Um, China is now a huge media story in Australia. Every day there are front page stories about China, whether it's um, you know, Hong Kong or Xinjiang or political donations or cyber hacks or foreign investment or the detention of Australian citizens or the trade war, it's just relentless. Mm. So can I ask you, how does a democracy like Australia, how do we manage a relationship with a nation like China that is so different from us, that is run by a Leninist political party? In our national interests, full stop. That's how you do it. And you need to know what they are and how they're impacted. I think one of the ways we are, I contend, successfully managing this relationship is just being incredibly consistent. We know where our lines are. We know where our benefits are. We know where they're shared. We know where we disagree. Uh, we are careful in the way we engage in what we say and what we do. Uh, we don't concede. We don't step back. Um, and, you know, in any relationship, stability is incredibly important. We're not a variable in this relationship. And we're not a variable because our government has a very clear understanding of what our national interest is and who we are and what we hope to achieve and the stability we seek to um, foster in the region. Stable region, everybody wins. I don't think a prime minister's been to China since, what, about 2016? It's been a while. I was, I was last there in... Um, as treasurer in 2017. Do you hope you'll be going to Beijing soon? Well, I'd be happy to go. But, you know, I'm not waiting by the phone. Um, and nor should Australian Prime Minister be. Um, if, if they would like to invite us to come to China, we'd be happy to go. And I'm pleased by, you know, in the last month, we've had two meetings between our foreign ministers. Our trade ministers have been meeting. I spoke to the ambassador just the other day. Um, so. I think we should be careful about over-interpreting uh, some of those events um, and, uh, you know, we'll continue to, to engage in the, in the way we have and, and we're happy to go. But at the same time, if that, that doesn't transpire, then it's, it's not troubling me. You mentioned in your speech that China had changed the world in many ways in your lifetime. True. And we saw that, even in the last week, we saw these two incredible demonstrations of China, Chinese power. You saw the ICBMs mm. rolling through Tiananmen Square and you saw Hong yeah. Kong demonstrations being put down mm. by authorities. I mean, when you look at that, aren't there worrying overtones from those two demonstrations of power? Well, they're, they're not hard to miss. Um, and you need to be very wide-eyed in understanding all the points that you've just made. And particularly the situation in, in Hong Kong has, has been troubling for some time, and that's why we have been counselling um, restraint. Broadly, very broadly, you could say that has occurred, but not always. And we would hope that constraint and restraint I should say, restraint would, uh, would prevail. But the fact that China has become such a strong economic and military power, I'm constantly surprised at the surprise about this. I mean, what was the point? Everybody said we should, and this happened you know, a generation ago and more, let's engage with China, let's bring them into the, the global community, let's end the exile. What, did we think we were doing that for them to stay exactly where they were? That their economic development would not lead to some of these other things and change the bow balance in, in our region? I mean, whoever wrote that paper 
that said it wasn't going to end up like that. I hope it's not still working for the Australian government. Mm. Well, um, they didn't work for the Lowy Institute. <laughs> I mean, th this is what I find surprising. This is the, the inevitable result of the path that we deliberately got on. And so I think it's important in responding to it is not to get too emotional um, or uh, outraged that this has occurred, but simply to practically understand it as a natural consequence of where the world and the global economy has got to. See, when you look at it like that and go, well, okay, so the trade rules have to be adjusted to res respect that. And the balance and cooperation of nations that sit with India Pacific, well, that'll change a bit. Um, but if you look at this as some great ideological struggle between two worldviews, well, that can take you to a very dangerous end. And I don't subscribe to that analysis. I don't think it's in Australia's interest. Finally, let me bring you closer to home. Let me ask you about the Pacific. Mm. You've been quite unusual, actually, for a Prime Minister in, in making the Pacific your signature foreign policy sort of region early on. I think, for example, today you announced you'd be going back to Fiji next care. week, which I think is the third or fourth time in a year that an Australian PM has stopped in Fiji. Why do you feel so strongly about the Pacific? Oh, there are many reasons, and personally, um, I have a deep connection um, with the Pacific, and some from when I was a very young boy. But that's really not the point. Um, the point is that our Pacific family and their success, their independence, their, their sovereignty, their resilience is important to Australia because it creates a stable arc around our, around our domain. The Pacific is not our domain, it's their domain. But our domain, our waters, our, our territories. And th this is the same reason why I think one of Australia's greatest uh, achievements um, has, was the Ramsey Initiative, um, which the former Prime Minister Howard sh should be absolutely um, proud of. And you know that when I was in, the, in the, the Solomons recently, and I was standing at the uh, parade ground of the, uh, the Royal Constabulary, this is a Royal Constabulary that Australians trained, built. And at the very moment when their nation was facing its greatest test since the, the, the events that led to Ramsey, uh, an election held, an uprising and a revolt that sought to overturn an elected government, the one thing standing between democracy and stability prevailing in the Solomon Islands and those rioting on the streets was the Royal Constabulary that was trained by Australians. And they stood up. They're national heroes, and they should be. But Australia should feel very, very proud. And everyone who served, whether in a police uniform, a DFAT uniform, a military uniform, whatever they did, they should feel very proud of that precise moment, because you know, history often comes down to those moments. And that was 16 years in the making. An arc of stability, of resilience, of independence, of sovereignty um, in the Pacific is very important to Australia. We saw what happens many, many years ago when the Pacific falls and when the Pacific is the target of aggressors. It's very important that we maintain those bonds. And the stronger they are, um, the better Australia is and the greater our national interests are served. The underlying part to it, though, frankly, is we are family. That relationship goes beyond, I think, any other, um, it is a deep family relationship, and that's how also it's seen. Families also argue, and there was a lot of noise. Sure, that yeah, they do. There, there, there were a few family arguments at, at the Pacific Islands Forum mm. in Tuvalu and criticism of Australia. Yep. Is there any sense that our climate policies are a drag on our influence in the Pacific? Well, one of the things I was pleased about at the Pacific Islands Forum is it was a long night. Um, but it also gave me the opportunity with all the other leaders to take, through, take them through what we'd actually been doing, which they were not aware of. And the Prime Minister of Samoa in particular said, look, could you actually put that down on one sheet of paper for me? I've never heard that before. They have responded um, to many things that they understood to have been what Australia's position was and actions was, but was surprised to learn of the, the detailed information I was able to provide to them. And, uh, but that said, I understand the deep passion 
and, uh, and feelings that they have on that particular issue. And that's why I was at pains to stress to them how seriously we take it and, and what we do. Um, whether that will ever completely satisfy some, I think is an open question. But is it impacting, I think, fundamentally the nature of the deep relationship we have as a family? No, I don't. I mean, Frank uh, Barley Marama and I have an excellent relationship. Um, he wasn't terribly happy with me that morning. He was texting me from the plane the second he got off back in Suva, quite friendly. Um, that's the nature. There's give and take. There's respect. I respect the fact that he feels as strongly as he does. I'm certainly not offended by it because um, I know he's speaking it to me from a deep place of conviction and how can I do anything other than respect him for that? Final question, PM. You've travelled quite a lot as Prime Minister. You've visited a lot of countries. What, 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 has been, what has been the most memorable moment on the international stage that you've had as PM? Would there be one moment that sticks out? Yeah, and it happened in Australia. Uh, standing in the silence beside the Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe, as we laid a reef in Darwin. Uh, it was intergenerational. It was beyond current events. It was a moment of, uh, it's a very emotional thing. It was a moment of generational healing, an act of grace from a, a great leader for which I will be forever grateful to him for. Well, thank you, PM. Thank you for taking our questions. Thank you for showing, for telling us a little bit about what it's like um, to be to be the prime minister. I want to I want to wish you luck on behalf of everyone here as you represent our country. I will come back in a little while to introduce Penny Wensley to move a, a formal vote of thanks. But before I do so, can I please ask you to join me in thanking the PM for giving such an important speech and for taking my questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.